reverse psychology I use there is if you trust your team members enough with information, then that will make them automatically trust you. You're listening to CX Passport, the show about creating great customer experiences with a dash of travel talk. Each episode, we'll talk with our guests about great CX, travel, and just like the best journeys, explore new directions we never anticipated. I'm your host, Rick Denton. I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. Let's get going. Welcome back to the Departures Hall CX Passport Travelers. Today, it's going to be a little bit of a change from our typical journey as we get into an important topic that you might not immediately associate with customer experience. It is my honor to introduce you to our next guest, Stephanie Corden, a dynamic force in leadership training, executive coaching, and mental health advocacy. Stephanie embodies a holistic approach to leadership, recognizing the profound connection between mental wellness and customer experience. As a mental health counselor turned CEO and founder of Dembo Inc., Stephanie's journey is defined by her commitment to nurturing both the emotional well-being of individuals and the operational excellence of organizations. Stephanie's journey encompasses roles at Oregon Pest Control and Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, where she honed her skills in operations management and leadership development. Recognized as one of the top 15 trainers in hospitality for 2021 by the International Hospitality Institute, Stephanie is a pioneer in bridging the gap between corporate leaders and their teams. So let's explore that intersection of mental health, leadership development, customer experience with Stephanie today. Learn how prioritizing mental wellness within organizations not only fosters employee satisfaction and loyalty, but also translates into exceptional customer interactions and heightens brand perception. Stephanie, welcome to CX Passport. Thank you so much for having me, Rick, and what a beautiful introduction. I appreciate it. Well, it is a beautiful <laughs> background and a beautiful history that makes for a beautiful introduction, so I'm eager to have you on the show today. Yeah, we are going to go other directions today. I really do want to focus with that, that topic that we don't talk about on this show all that much, and really, as a society, haven't talked about as much as we should, although in the last years, maybe decade or so, we've talked more about it. Mm -hmm. So let's start with that focus on mental health and leadership. What sure. drew you to link those two together? And then how do you apply that to your business practice? Sure, sure. So um, what drew me to um, what drew me to link those two together um, started with me in hospitality as a learning and development director, trying to move away from cookie cutter cutter ways of doing training and cookie cutter ways of understanding people. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, if I back up a little bit, I had the brilliant idea that I would leave hospitality for a little while. And I went into mental health counseling. I got my master's degree and I worked in, as a counselor for two years, not leaving hospitality quite yet, just as mm -hmm. a part-time thing gig. And I found a wealth of information. Um, I can always link back to my work, um, you know, as a, as a leadership development um, trainer and coach. And that's when I realized that I can always use these tips and tricks and theories and frameworks to mm -hmm. bring back into um, creating trainings that were less um, cookie cutter and more for the environment that I was in, right? Yeah. Um, for example, just because a hotel is a hotel doesn't mean a hotel on South Beach should um, be the people at a hotel in South Beach, I should say, should be trained the same as the people at a hotel in West Palm Beach. So okay. South Beach, you have um, a party um, area. People are on vacation. They want to drink. They want to party. So the team members that are, you know, helping those guests should be trained a little bit differently than in West Palm Beach, where it's slower, it's calmer, you get right. a lot of retirees, um, you get snowbirds, people who have retired, who live up north and come down south when it's cold. So it's two different mindsets, two different um, worlds, pretty much. So mm -hmm. it's 
people shouldn't be trained for customer service the same way um, in those two environments. And that's when I found, figured that out. I realized that mental wellness and the way we think, the way we um, project our emotions have a lot to do with the way we should be training our team members. Okay, that last part really caught me because mm -hmm. I, I was thinking, okay, so I can, I can see how um, a uniqueness in training would be important between those two worlds, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely, mm -hmm. South Beach versus West. I thought you were going to mm -hmm. say something like, you know, going to South Dakota or something like that. So <laughs> certainly a difference there. The then you started to get into though, and it is that mental approach that you are taking into that role, not just the uniqueness of the training, and so. Walk me through a little bit of that. How can that focus on mental health influence how a company or in the case of you're describing here, an individual deliver that experience for a customer? Sure, sure. So what I always, the example that I use a lot of times when I, when I balance those two is the, what somebody's expecting to find in South Beach is not what they're expecting to find when they go to West Palm Beach. So the team member even though it might be that same team member that travels from South Beach to West Palm Beach, has to do that pivot, you know, that mm -hmm. mindset shift, right? And it's important to teach the team member how to do that pivot because you don't want a team member that's expecting a slow night to fall, like to stumble upon a busy night that would be South Beach or uh -huh. the craziness that would be South Beach without them knowing what they're walking into immediately when the person is not expecting that they're going to be dealing with um 120 drunks versus <laughs> you know 50 people who are just looking to be chill and relaxed right their anxiety goes up right and as soon as they're feeling overwhelmed, the work is not going to be the same. They're either going to um, act in a state. So it's, it, it brings it up a state of fight or flight, right? Mm -hmm. So they're either going to be frustrated and that's going to show in their service or they're going to freeze. And that too is going to show in their service. It, I would imagine that, no, I shouldn't lead with that. I feel like I'm leading the witness, Your Honor. Uh, <laughs> I'm curious, mental health, a lot of that is the state in which you sort of walk into. How healthy are you kind of coming into that? And I imagine that has some sort of effect on that delivery of customer experience, not just the switching back and forth. Let's say that you're always the, the, the South Beach person and you are the life of the party. Mm -hmm. But how, how can someone really focus on their mental health in a way that helps them deliver a customer experience so that when they're going into whatever their situation is, whether uh, any situation, any work scenario, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what is it that they need to be doing from a mental health perspective so that they can deliver great customer experience? That is an awesome question, and it is a simple answer, oh, good. at least on the surface, right? Self-awareness, right? When the person is fully grounded and they fully take the time to understand who they are and how they operate, then no matter what environment they walk into, they are going to thrive because mm -hmm. they can stay in their power and their groundedness. But that is also a training, that is also coaching that needs to happen. And that is like a, a bigger um, conversation or training, we should say. Yeah. So to start with, we wanna suggest that, hey, this person, you should know this is the environment that you're going into, which we should always do, whether or not the per we know that the person is mentally ready for any mm -hmm. environment, we should still tell them that this is the environment you're going into. But what I find is when the person is mentally healthy, then they're grounded, they're, they fully know who they are and how they operate as a person, then the um, environment won't shape them too much. This is your captain speaking. I want to thank you for listening to CX Passport today. We've now reached our cruising altitude, so I'll turn that seatbelt sign off. While you're getting comfortable, hit that follow or subscribe button on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. Love if you'd tell a friend about CX Passport, leave a review so others can discover the show as well. Now, sit back and enjoy the rest of the episode. Uh, so I'm here, he, 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 listeners and viewers can hear both the stutter. Viewers, you can see me sort of hesitating because <laughs> I'm thinking of that from an individual perspective, right? Mm -hmm. It's it, the self-awareness. 
okay, I work through it. I process it. I know who I am, uh, what my beliefs are, and 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 I know the state that I'm coming in with. I have coping tools for that. Mm-hmm. However, a lot of the 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 business world doesn't really value you bringing you to work. They value you bringing what they need you to bring to work. So how are you and how can a company be more, well, self-aware? Let me just use that term in the (laughs) sense of mental wellness and the mental Mm -hmm. health of their employees in that way. And so this is what I stand for now. This is the thing that I'm shouting from the rooftops, right? (laughs) That you should definitely, as a business, as a company, be more aware and make sure that your team members are aware. But to answer your question, how can we bring that into the company? How can we make sure? Um, My way of doing it right now is just telling them basically, hey, you know, you have a culture problem or you have an environment problem that is bigger than the little conflict resolution that you hired before or the standard operating procedure that you're looking for me to do. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm saying it. This is how we can fix it. Um, So pretty much laying it out in a convincing way and showing them that if they go this route, if it's more self-aware, if there's more transparency, if there's more communication, then the bottom line is bound to grow. Because when uh, when your team members understand their role, they tend to take their role, their leadership more seriously, their self-leadership, right? So once they understand their roles in what's happening, then everything falls into place and businesses make more money. Uh, well, <laughs> and and that is something that, well, listeners certainly have heard me preach about is tangible business results, right? This mm-hmm. isn't fluffer nutter. Mental health is not something that is just, well, it's kind and we're humans. And that's a good part, right? We are kind yeah. and humans. Mm-hmm. However, CFOs, well, CFOs can be kind and human. I, I don't mean to say that, but <laughs> the business is in the business of being profitable aside from exactly. nonprofits. And so exactly. how this can improve and address that. Let's let's do a little pivot because you did have that that deep stint there in hospitality. You know, yep. with certainly an iconic brand uh, in, in the Hard Rock brand uh-huh. and then, uh, you know, other elements in that hospitality space with all of those years of hospitality experience in your past. How does that carry forward into how you approach customer experience today? So uh, one of the things that I like to say is that I started in hospitality when I was 17 as a server and then I went and became a bartender and then I moved into hotels as a front okay. desk agent and then I worked my way up from there. So I've pretty much been in customer service my entire life and obviously mm. if you know anything about guest services you know customer is king right so that's the mentality that even when like even though i um teach team members now how to approach it in a more holistic view as opposed to just whatever the guest wants or whatever the customer wants that is the foundation for me right okay making the customer happy so that's where that comes from for me. Yeah, I imagine. Boy, I don't. I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm tempted to ask. Maybe we'll just <laughs> touch on it. I have to imagine that as a bartender, mm-hmm. you really learned, and it's stereotypical, but you really learned some of those listening skills, the empathy skills that we value so much in in, in our frontline customer contact roles and not just contact, but retail, frontline, server, whatever that looks like. Yeah, Was that something that you felt like was ingrained in you or is it something that you felt growing in you as you were in that bartender role? So I, for me, I think that I had um, started with my listening and I guess I like to call it my psychology skills a little bit (laughs) earlier, (laughs) but definitely I say as a bartender, I was an unofficial therapist, right? Because people come and they told me stories that I had no business knowing at 18 years old. (laughs) Okay. So we're going to do another podcast called Bartender Secrets. (laughs) Right. (laughs) We'll start that one. All right. But um, yes, I would say that that was where I started to grow my and hone my skills, my listening skills, my understanding skills, and my communication skills all together. Yeah. And I imagine, okay, so there's a question that I want to ask you, and I Mm -hmm. I did not expect it to relate to to bartending, but I think it may come back to this because one of the things about bartending is not only are you there to listen, you're there to do a job. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I imagine in a crowded, you know, 
maybe Friday night, whatever that looks like. Yeah, you're going to be empathetic, but you also got a job to do. Mm -hmm. And I had posted back in February, uh, I posted a video on LinkedIn about a really poor customer service experience that I'd had with a home services platform. Mm -hmm. And not only did they fail on the actual task, the customer service experience after the failure of the task was just infuriating. I got peppered with all of these faux empathy phrases. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I, I can tell why you would be so upset by that. I can appreciate oh, why that would be a concern to you. And I'm like, <sighs> and I'm just taking these stop. deep breaths. <laughs> and then a phrase like, well, we'll reschedule you at no cost. Oh, uh, my head oh. exploded because I'm like, son wow. of a yeah. it's y'all's fault. Why? <laughs> of course it'd be no cost. In fact, you need to give my money back. Mm -hmm. And so I had this empathy, but it was faux empathy and the job wasn't getting done. Mm -hmm. So channeling kind of thinking back to the bartender, really just sort of in general, we have all this focus on customer service. People like mm -hmm. me that are consultants, there's podcasts, there's training, mm -hmm. there's all that, all these tools that exist around customer experience. And yet, Stephanie, why is customer service still so poor? So one of the reasons that comes up for me as you were saying that, and I talk about it a lot, is the box that we tend to put our team members in, right? So you see those words, those faux empathy that that person was giving you. It's mm. probably something that he clicks or she clicks mm -hmm. and it tells her step by step, this is what you say first. And then this is what you say. And then they just copy and paste it. Mm -hmm. And then, or they say it, you know, if it's over the phone, they just read it out to you because they're in this little box and they don't feel like they can come out of that box or, you know, stray away from right. what they are told to say. Um, and one of the things that I, I always fight with hotels more specifically with is when the front desk tells you, like you rent a room for, you know, I don't know, $400 a night, let's say, right? And then something happens and the front desk agent is like, oh, my apologies, we can credit you $25. And you're like, what? <laughs> like, I just spent $1,200 and you're talking about crediting me $25. What is that going to do? But the thing is, that's the only thing that they can do, you mm -hmm. know, unless they go to a supervisor or a higher up. So one of the things that I always um, try to fight for is to give team members more leeway you know um allow them to be able to go i don't want to say fail but go off and experiment and tr at least you know fail in a way that's not going to obviously hurt the company but let them explore what they can do how they would want somebody to help them right mm -hmm. and that's some of the training that i help people with now you and I share a very similar philosophy there mm -hmm. uh, around uh, equip and uh, empower is such an overused word, but still just, mm -hmm. you know, al allow the people to be human a bit. And you're right. I, I, it does sound like I'm agent blaming here. And I know that that agent was doing exactly what you just said. Yep. Script, 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 <laughs> probably while they were being asked to perform 10 chats at the same time. So why with with the realization that customers are actually choosing companies, I fired this company, I will not do business with them again, yeah. choosing companies based off of their actual customer service experience, why wouldn't a company allow an agent to do what you're describing? Or maybe more positively, how have you seen companies evolve to where they are allowing that hotel front desk to behave in the way that you're describing? Yeah, so lately I've been seeing more and more of that, but not to, you know, I don't want to stereotype or categorize, but what I've noticed is the hotels that have been here for a long time that have been very much, you know, um, profitable and just have been doing things the way they've been doing it. They have mm -hmm. the mentality of if it's not broke, don't fix it type of thing. And that's what's holding them back a little bit in that sense. Um, because they already know they're established and people are going to come and, you know, these team members are going to do what they tell them to do. And they feel like they have more control over the team members when they are telling them, hey, you can only credit this person $25. You can't stray from that. Hey, this is what you, this is a script. This is what you need to tell them. So it, it's a way of control. And what I've found lately is the 
companies that are starting smaller, like the boutique hotels, the inns and stuff like that, they're a little bit more laid mm-hmm. back in that sense. They're a little bit more willing and open to exploring. And as I say that, there are some big um, hotel chains that are becoming more lenient, but that's because their team members that are coming on are a little bit more rebellious so to speak. Hey, right? all right. <laughs> yeah. So they're doing it a little bit their way. And people, the managers, the executives are finding that that way that they're just doing it instead of waiting for a supervisor, they're just taking on um, the chance to do something. And they like to use the word, I made an executive decision, right? And and they literally do that. I've like I've gotten complaints sure. from HR saying, hey, these people are making executive decisions that they're not supposed to. How do we stop them? But what they're seeing is those executive decisions are making customers happy. There were a couple of things that came to mind there when you Mm -hmm. said, well, things are working just fine. Eh, There's no reason to change. We're highly profitable. Mm -hmm. Blockbuster. And so... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's the first one that gave my the second one is actually a former CX Passport guest, Zoe Khan. Mm-hmm. She talked about the profitable rule breaker. And when you talk about the rebels coming in, and the idea was okay, we break a few rules, it's profitable, it's all right for the company if we uh bend a few rules and then create the customer loyalty. Mm-hmm. I realize it's a challenge. Like, you know, somebody listening to this is like, okay, Rick, that's really nice to say on a, mm-hmm. on a on a podcast. Stephanie, that's really nifty. It can be kind of hard. And so I know there's a lot of nuance to that. And sometimes that oh, yeah. nuance can get our heads spinning. And sometimes mm-hmm nice to take a little break and so i invite you to take that little break with me take that little we're gonna break. stop down here in the first class lounge move a little quickly here and have a little bit of fun what is a dream travel location from your past from my past i would have to say it's always haiti i love going to haiti and all right that's always a dream travel location for me <laughs> that's fantastic I, yeah. I think hey you may be my first haiti answer what is it about haiti that draws you so I don't know. I just feel at home and I love mm. that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Boy, there is something about when travel equals home. It, yes. It's the not home, but it's the home. Yes. Ooh, yeah, that I... home that you don't have to pay bills at. You're disconnected <laughs> from everything. <laughs> well, I don't know if this is going to feel like home, but what is a dream travel location you've not been to yet? A dream travel location. I just added um, Santorini to my bucket list. Great. Okay. Mm-hmm. I don't think I need to ask why, but I still am going to. What's drawing you to Santorini? Um, I'm an island girl at heart. So wherever there's tell. beautiful blue waters, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm drawn. And I saw like this retreat style home um that my cousin actually he's like I'm, i know you'd love this and i saw this retreat style home and it's overlooking the water and it's just beautiful oh, this is i'm awesome. like yeah this is this is some place i need to get to <laughs> all right well, we got haiti we got santa Rita. yeah i i see the islands in you absolutely <laughs> what is a favorite thing of yours to eat pizza Okay. No, no question. Just plain Hands down. Pizza. We're not even going to have another conversation about it. Pizza, <laughs> indeed. All right. Going the other way. What is something you were forced to eat as you were growing up, but you hated as a kid? I was forced to eat as, I would have to say grits. And it's yellow grits. I hated yeah? it. But I love it now, believe it or not. Oh, about. okay. Now, even as a kid, I loved my grits. Oh, I and so... hated it. <laughs> I can see the texture, whatever, yeah, that kind of thing as a kid. No, I loved it back then. Um, that's funny. What is one travel item, not including mm-hmm. your phone, not including your passport, that you will not leave home without? So I, you said one travel item, but I have this little travel bag, right, that mm-hmm. I put everything that I think is essential in there. And that little bag, if I leave it, my world is crumbling. Stephanie, I've got a, a, a travel. It sits in my closet that it, mm-hmm. when it's time to travel, just grab it, drop yep. it in. So I, I understand that approach. I've duplicated so many items so that I don't even have to think about packing. Just grab, mm-hmm. drop it in. Boom. Yep. I want to go back to kind of that employee, the leadership aspect of mm-hmm. things. You know, so much of your work centers on leadership and the connection or well, the disconnection with employees. It's, uh-huh. I know it's cliche, but often employees feel like there's this lack of communication. 
which then creates this lack of respect for their leaders. Why is that still occurring? How are you teaching leaders to communicate with their teams? So why is it still occurring is the same reason we were talking about earlier about if it's not broke, don't fix it. We still have that mentality that um, on a need to know basis, right? Oh, they don't need to know about that. Or, oh, that's too much information to provide. And what I've seen that's happened so many times is just that little bit of information that we thought might be too much information is the reason why the team member is not doing the job fully because they just don't fully understand what they need to be doing to reach that goal with you, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that I do now is make sure I hone in or I drill in my leader's head that communication is key and the the, I guess, reverse psychology I use there is if you trust your team members enough with information, then that will make them automatically trust you. And that's where the respect comes in. And that's where the, you know, they start to own their role in Mm -hmm. the, in the, in the position that they're in because they understand what's happening more and more. And I found that that's worked. Like, the trust has to be mutual. It can't be, oh, I'm the manager, you're the employee, you have to trust me, whatever I say goes. That's not how human nature works. Yeah, no, it's certainly not like (laughs) that feels like a work style that we as humans were willing to put up with a century ago, but it Mm -hmm. certainly doesn't apply now. Now, you you said something about kind of that little nugget that Mm -hmm. enabled the employee to do their job. Mm -hmm. And absolutely like that piece of communication that unlocked something that's good. I imagine, though, that even the the leader that desires to communicate, there is this tension mm-hmm. that, you know, we, we talk about we want full transparency and we, we hear that a lot. That, though, can have a mixed impact on the employee experience. How are you helping folks balance that those extremes of full transparency? Everything is known and then leadership holding everything close to the vest. Yes, that is an awesome question as well, Rick. Um, so. I do not fall into the full transparency category. I don't yeah. believe that people need to know every single thing that is happening inside of a company. I think that would cause dumpster fires all the time. People <laughs> would panic. You know, there yeah. there would cause anxiety, right? So what I do is to have my leaders find a happy median, right? What's the balance between telling them enough telling them what they need to know, as opposed to just telling them, you know, all the skeletons in the closet. So for me, that is how comfortable are you telling them X and let's tell them Y, right? Yeah. If stopping at X is what's uncomfortable for you or what's comfortable for you, let's take it a step further and tell them Y, but let's not tell them Z. Because then we're getting into their t- um, territory that is not necessary. That skeleton in the closet territory. Okay, so that's I get how this. I categorize it. Kind of go to go to your discomfort point. Yes. Uh, really well. Let's go back to something you said earlier in the episode. Mm-hmm. Become self aware. I realize I'm tying two different <laughs> self awarenesses here. No, but, but it's true. Be self aware as to am I just uncomfortable because I'm a little more of a controlling person, or really mm-hmm. no, this is information that shouldn't be out there, and then understand the why behind it, and exactly. realize where those boundaries are. Exactly. You, you've said something, and I may want to close with this, mm-hmm. but it is, it was this idea of, you know, that's the way things have always been. That's the, you know, why, why is customer service the way it is? Why, why, why is communication not there? What does it take for a company to break out of that? Well, that's the way we've always done it. And especially when it comes to customer experience, because inertia is strong here. How can a company not do it the way they've always done it and use that as a way to improve customer experience. So that is one of the hardest things that we've had to do, right? Getting Mm -hmm. a company or their leaders, the executives to break out of that's the way we've always done it. But the way that I've found that works mostly is because one, they will call if, I mean, obviously for me to go into a company, I have to get that call. They'd have to see a need, right? So once they see that need, that's my, you know, leeway, my entry point to get them to understand that whatever that you're looking at, that conflict that you see, or that issue with customer service that you see, it's deeper. 
okay. let's dig and let's find what it is, right? So a lot of times me being able to show them the real data, me doing interviews with their teams, or even sometimes if necessary with their guests in a certain way, um, our customers, I say guests because hotel, oh, yeah. with their customers or clients in, um, on, a, on a certain level has helped for me to get data to show that, hey, this is where we are now and this is where we can be if we fix the cause of your issues as opposed to trying to fix the symptoms. Because conflict, you calling me in to do a conflict resolution training is just slapping a Band-Aid on yeah. a deeper issue. And that's where we need to be. Let's close there. Because uh, exactly. So I, I may help you with a little bit of conflict resolution, but it's it, why is this conflict continuing to arise? What will it take for us to get to that point of exactly. understanding what that looks like? Stephanie, if folks want to get to know a little bit more about you, the services you offer, your perspective on mental health and its application to, to leadership, your hospitality experience, customer experience, leadership development, all that. What's the best way for folks to get to know a little bit more about you? Sure. They can go to my website at zemboinc.com and that's D-E-M-B-O-I-N-C.com. And I'm on LinkedIn at Stephanie Corradin. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook on Stephanie Corradin. All right. Well, I will get all of that into the show notes, as folks know, you are accustomed to not hitting pause, but rather just scrolling down, clicking the link and interacting <laughs> with Stephanie in that way. Awesome. Stephanie did really enjoy this. Like I, it really was when you and I first met, I didn't really know how a mental health conversation, it, I don't want to say that I didn't know how it applied to customer yeah. experience, but really drawing us into that and understanding mm -hmm. that sense of self-awareness being so vital into the employee and then the company's willingness to appreciate that self-awareness and then how that carried the hospitality experience and how mm -hmm. that it cascades into communication and beyond it, it this has been a fun a fun journey with you uh thank you I I, i've learned it. quite a bit yeah so <laughs> stephanie awesome well <laughs> stephanie thank you for being on cx passport i appreciate it thanks for joining us this week on cx passport if you like today's episode i have three quick next steps for you click subscribe on the cx passport youtube channel or your favorite podcast app Next, leave a comment below the video or a review in your favorite podcast app so others can find and enjoy CX Passport too. Then head over to cxpassport.com for show notes and resources that can help you create tangible business results by delivering great customer experience. Until next time, I'm Rick Denton, and I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. 